the intensity of the fire came so fast, so hard, that it knocked us down to the ground. And I, at that was a time when I thought, this is it. I think this is going to be it. I just... Well, it's John Hacker. I come from a country far, far away called California. We're filming this in North Carolina. I've been here about four years. But I went to high school out there and college uh, at uh, San Francisco. I was drafted in 1966. Funny thing about it is I got my draft notice. My, my mother calls me. I was working at the time. I was, I was with the old F.W. Woolworth Company as a manager trainee type thing. So she calls me and she says, uh, when you get home, I got something for you. And she, sounded very, and she said, Johnny, I have something for you. And she never calls me Johnny unless I'm in trouble. So I came home and I worked till about 8 o'clock that night. So I came home about 9 o'clock and she's usually in bed, but she's, she's sitting there. And my dad's over there having a sandwich and a beer or something. And she says, uh, here, here's this letter. And I said, oh, okay. And so I put this letter down. She says, open it up, Johnny. Okay. So I opened it up and, of course, there was a draft notice. Greetings from the President of the United States. And she, she just had a fit. My son, and she went running into the bedroom. My dad comes up and says, well, congratulations, son, you got drafted. And I said, oh, okay. Still, I'm still kind of, what does that mean? You know, I don't know. And uh, so about a month later, uh, I ended up going to uh, Oakland, I believe it was. And that's where I got processed. I still didn't think I was going to go. I mean, I thought, well, I'll be processed and I'll come home and then go. But they took us right off and put us on a plane to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. And that's where I served my basic training and my AIT. And then from there, I think I went to uh, uh, Fort Campbell for uh, tank training. I learned how to drive an armored car, an armored carrier, if you will. And I was there for about a month, probably, on that one. And then uh, went back to uh, I went, uh, went to Fort Hood, Texas. And I thought this is pretty cool because I was, I was almost uh, about 14, 15 months left in my service. So I thought, well, tanker, so I'll probably go to Germany. Wrong, you know, and then uh, they activated, I guess, the Americal Division at that time and put a lot of people up together. And, and uh, I was still driving the carriers. Uh, I, I became a driver, actually, for a little bit. I drove Captain Brennan around for a little bit. But uh, they said, well, you'll still be an armored carrier. We're not sure where this is going to go. But then I started seeing movies where the armored carrier was getting blown up and the driver was getting killed. And I said, I don't want to be, I don't want to do this anymore. So they gave me a rifle, I became a rifleman. And then uh, ultimately I became a, a team leader with Larry Shaw, hit the squad, third, first platoon, third squad. And uh, ended up in Vietnam. Well, we went over by, by ocean, by, by the boat, by the ship, <laughs> excuse me. So nowadays when I talk to people, I say, how many people are in the Navy in the room? And they'll raise their hands and I'll say, thank you for my very first cruise ship, which was in uh, November, I believe, 67. So we arrived there. Uh, at the end of 67, end of November, I believe it was. Well, Gary Stating and Alan Allen and I, I think the three of us, we went to, I don't know if it was Alan was with us or not, somebody else, it might have been. We went to Galveston, you know, and boy, we thought we were going to have a good time there. You know, that was just a long trip to Galveston, Fort Hood. Uh, but, but uh, Gary had his California flag and he hang, hung it out from the window. and uh, So we had uh, some good times there, if you will, that weekend. Uh, I think the biggest thing was when we first met Captain Brennan and First Sergeant Rodriguez. I mean, these guys were like gods. I mean, these were, you know, you saw these guys. Both of them were combat experience. And you just looked at them and you go, wow, these, these people know what they're doing. So we felt pretty good about it, but we were also intimidated about it. I know I was, because I thought, I don't want to screw this up at all, man. And uh, First Sergeant was a tough guy, but he was very, he had a heart of gold. He, he didn't let you know about it, though. But there were times when I saw that heart of gold come out. He was, he was a very special guy. But Captain Brennan was just, you know, he'd been there before. And so you just, you felt safe. You thought, okay, if I listen to what this guy tells me, uh, I'll be okay. So the training went on about just, you know, we got the, we turn, I think we turned in the M14s, got the M16s, learned how to use those, uh, broke down the squads, who, who's doing what. Larry Shaw was our squad leader. 
did a really good job. I think I became like his team leader at that time, if I'm not mistaken. And I got promoted to uh, E5. And uh, so our training was just out there all the time in the field. I mean, always in the field. And then we became more in the choppers, you know, how to work, how to work off the choppers and the landing. So our training was pretty thorough, I believe. And uh, by the time we got shipped out, uh, I think most of us were feeling like we knew what we were doing. And uh, we brought in more experienced leaders, you know, uh, the, uh, the leadership of, the, of, the, of the, so the company changed a bit. You know, some of the sergeants that were not maybe combat experienced, they brought in some combat experienced uh, soldiers. Van Horn was uh, our uh, platoon sergeant. Tough guy, man, I tell you. That guy spit bullets. He was a tough guy, and uh, I remember when I when I got my stripes, I had I had specialists, and he he comes up to me, and I don't know, Alan, Alan some some of the guys were around there. I mean, Alan, Alan was everywhere, and he comes up with his knife. Uh, Van Horn comes up and rips off my my uh, my specialist stripes, and puts these sergeants and just hits me so hard in the shoulder, I was bruised. You know, he says, "Now you're one of us." So what did that meant? So came uh, sergeant, but uh, the, the training was good. It was thorough, um, and Captain Brennan wanted to make sure that we were well trained. He went over things over and over again, and first sergeant and the other sergeants made sure that we knew what we were doing. So we felt pretty comfortable. Even going over by ship, we had we were still had uh, training going on, and uh, so it was pretty thorough. You know, my wife, and she went over on the Upshur years before. The Upshur, I guess, became from a troop transport to a military transport of some sort. I don't know it, but we've, we've kind of discovered that years ago. She said, I know something about the, that, that name. And so she researched, yeah, that was the ship. We went over, I think they went over to Germany uh, at that time, her family. Her, fa her dad was a colonel in the Army at the time. And uh, so uh, she was about 15, 16 years old when she went over there. Uh, the Upshur was just a Navy ship, and I think we had two battalions, maybe 198th and 196 were on, on it. And uh, we were at one end of it, and they were at the other end of it. And uh, you were up and on the deck, and the deck was so hot sometimes, just hot. And, but we couldn't go down below. They wouldn't let us go down below, so we were up there trying to find shade. Trying to keep busy, and the training was going on. I don't know what kind of training, but it, but it was just, you know, know your enemy and things like that. And so uh, I think it was 22 days, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, but uh, <laughs> again, you got to remember, I was 20 years old, you know, 21. I get no, I was 20. I celebrated my 21st birthday on a berm in Vietnam because we were on on this on this berm. I think it was Alan again, Alan Allen. Said somebody, what day is this? And somebody said it's March thirteenth. And I said that's my birthday. And one of the guys said, well, "Happy birthday, Hack." I said, "Well, there you go." But uh, and I don't remember when we got off the ship. We went on, on these other smaller boats, I guess it was, that took us to today took us to the shore, whatever that was. But uh, then a lot of guys got sick on that ship. I thought I I, I was lucky. I never got seasick. But man, I tell you, there there'd be guys who just be up right there on the deck and go, "Oh my God." And they may have cleaned up. They may have brought the buckets out and threw them out there and wiped them down. But uh, it was a very special, very special ship. But uh, it was an it was an adventure for me. Well, we we're scared. I mean, we, we knew now. Now it's time. We're here now. And I think they gave us uh, a clip of like three rounds in it. I mean, just a very. What is this all about? And they said, don't do anything until we tell you. Don't chamber anything. Okay, I think it was just a few rounds, but we didn't. And, uh, you know, as we got more on shore, and I, I can't quite remember what happened once we got on shore and where we went. Uh, I'm sure we, we ate because we ate all the time. And then the next few days, we ended up going on our first uh, mission, you know, and I think it was just a training to get used to the, the terrain. And, uh, you know, uh, what do you do when, when you set up at night? The mosquitoes were awful. I mean, man, I'll tell you, they ate me alive. And uh, you know, the leeches, all that stuff. So, 
it just it, the the first several weeks were just really getting a, getting uh, used to the terrain, the operations. Every time we had an operation, they said, "Well, we expect ten or fifteen percent casualties." So, what does that mean? You know, and none of that really happened at first. We just went out. And we did receive a few shots from people. You know, but uh, nothing really serious for the first uh, couple of months. Really, I think one of our guys got hit. I'm not sure how he was killed, but we had one uh, that had gotten shot, gotten killed, but uh, nothing until February, really. Not search and destroy, but just a, a, a search mission. And I think we ran into some light fire. I think that's where our first casualty was. And uh, at that time, we again, as we moved forward in these things, and things happened to us, incoming fire, one of our troops was killed. All, you know, now we're seeing, okay, so this is what we're up against. This is how it's going to be. Okay, not bad, but okay. I mean, not good. But uh, my feeling was I thought, well, if I just play it easy, take care of myself and the guys I'm with, I think we'll be okay. Yeah, just all kinds of stress, I think, would be the best way. Now that, now that we didn't know what stress was, but that's probably what it was. Just, you know, I, sometimes I tell people I was there maybe 300 days. I wasn't there a full year because I rotated out earlier. And I think Vietnam was probably 260 days of fear and boredom with about 30 days of fear and fear stress. But uh, I think the day-to-day -day actions was just... Uh, Getting up, making sure you had all your gear, making sure your weapon was clean, uh, making sure everybody was okay, and following out the orders or whatever it may be. And then we'd rotate from uh, squad to squad to who was on point, if you will. So uh, just learning the fundamentals of it all, but trying to stay alert on things. You know, you just uh, to pay attention to details. That's what, that's what I felt that we had to do. At first, you know, you, you do everything by the numbers. Um, you find the location you're supposed to be at, uh, you set up, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. I don't think our squad was ever involved in an actual active uh, firefight on ambush. After about a dozen of those things, if that, if that may be, you kind of, well, let's go someplace where we're safe. And I like the moon. The moon was my friend because I could see things. And, you know, that's about, I, I've learned over the years, you know, it's about 21, 22 days between full moon to full moon, I guess it is. So I used to figure that out. And then you had about eight or nine days, maybe 10 days of moonshine, uh, moon glow, I guess we call it. And I, I, I kind of looked forward to that. So if I had my druthers, I'd try to go on, on the ambushes on those days. Sometimes we had our choice, sometimes we didn't. But if I had my choice, I would try, try to go around when it was moon bright. But uh, just getting prepared, making sure you don't uh, do anything stupid, and keep it light, uh, no heavy gear or anything. I mean, you didn't, you didn't. And you, you, know, you didn't wear a poncho because it would make noise. So you just, if it was raining, you just sucked it up. But um, those leeches and mosquitoes were just awful. So. You, you learn to put a bandana, a, banda, a bandana around your face if you could, so that way you wouldn't get uh, bitten so bad. But they, they loved me. I don't know what it was. I, I just didn't want to contact anybody. I heard a lot of noise. You know, we hear over the hill, or, or you know, it's so quiet out there that you can hear things. A long ways away. I, I, I don't know what the distance would be, but you could hear things. I could hear people talking. I'm hoping, I hope they don't come our way. Most of the time they did. I mean, or they came close, but they didn't come to us. So, you know, we set up the Claymore mine out there somewhere, and we try to be as, as strategic as possible. But after a while, you know, you try not to get sloppy on things, but you have a tendency, well, we won't put the Claymores out this time, or whatever it may be. But uh, just very, very edgy, and you don't, I, I didn't sleep, I mean, I don't think, I can't remember sleeping in Vietnam, to be honest with you, I know we did, but you just didn't want to do that, uh, and when I did get a chance to take 
my turn to sleep. I, I didn't sleep. I just kind of closed my eyes and waited till I got woke up again. It was just a very eerie. Never had that feeling in a sense. And just uh, hoping that nothing happens. I don't do anything that would, would provoke a problem. And we just, you know, we're waiting for somebody to come by and hope, hope they didn't come by. And fortunately, it looks like they didn't come by ours. I would consider Schultz like the big brother you, you always wanted. You know, he was just very quiet, but very straightforward with you. Uh, and I, I didn't never want to let him down. I mean, he never indicated to me that, I never saw him really get pissed off, to be honest with you. But you knew better. You just knew better. And you, you know, he was the kind of guy that you better do your job. Not only is because you're supposed to, but I wouldn't be put it past him to slap you upside the head, you know, if you did. Didn't do it. But uh, he was a fair guy and uh, didn't like any of the guys getting high on any uh, marijuana or anything like that. So he was very, he's watching out for that. And he'd see Gary and those guys do some things, and he just shook his head. So he was very much, I'm glad he was my squad leader because, you know, I had Larry and I had uh, First Sergeant, you know, and then Mac McCleary, these guys were all, you know, uh, very straight shooters. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, Larry can throw them down if he wanted to, but uh, he knew that uh, this was not the place to, to uh, get screwy. And uh, I, I tried to follow his lead. I really did. I was glad I was with him. There was uh, Studley and Dudley. Machine gun crew. That was Brugman and Conlon. Yeah, two guys you would have never thought would would get along together. I mean, both of them. I think we we're both from New Jersey, and it was like the odd couple. You know, <laughs> Conley always took care of the the machine gun, kept that sucker clean, and and uh, uh, the Dudley would just uh, he was a crack up, you know, and just always a loud loud guy. But I tell you, when it came time to fire those weapons, they brought on the heat. They brought on the heat. You knew they were there. And they didn't stop firing until it was over. But uh, those two guys, um, uh, let's see, Reinhardt, and there was, uh, uh, gosh, the guy I mentioned this morning, Billy Sandlin. Billy Sandlin was probably, uh, he was always the backup with me when I was on point, and I always felt very comfortable with that. And so was Reinhardt. And uh, there was a time we were on this one small trail. It was early when we got there. And this water buffalo got weird and started charging. I was on the point. Started charging. And I right away, I emptied my, my mag, automatic, you know, and it went all, everywhere. I don't think it hit anything. And I thought, what? And I think there was Billy who just stood, stepped up to one side, took two rounds, hit, shot him right in the head, and then just dropped him. And I thought, wow. And, this, and, and Billy was a country boy. You know, he, was, he, knew, how, he knew how these things worked. And he, uh, here I am in California. I didn't know. But I, I know if he hadn't have done that, I would have been rolled over by that buffalo. But uh, <clears throat> then, uh, let's see, there, Yoli. Yoli was another one. Uh, Yoli was a uh, Hispanic guy. And he was... He, he handled the M79. Very good at it. Very good at it. And then there was uh, Mays. Mays was another guy. Supposedly related to Willie Bays. I don't know if that's true or not, but I I, try, I believed him. Uh, another guy. All these guys had such different personalities, but when we were together on the line, it was all business. When we went in, back to the rear, it was whatever you want to do. But when we were on that line, we locked and loaded. It was like, business. And uh, I, I, <clears throat> I believe that's why we had low casualties because of those guys. Well, I think what happened when, leading up to February, uh, we, there was all kinds of rumors going around that they were, there was a buildup going on of some sort. So heads up, be alert. Don't trust anybody. You know, keep Keep your head down and keep locked and loaded and just walk, keep an eye on things. And so the intensity of the, of the patrols became 
more. Uh, not that we had any major changes. I mean, we still we we still kept getting sniped at, you know, and always staying. You know, <laughs> nowadays it would be the six foot rule, but you know we always try to stay apart so it would create a target, and uh, uh, that was probably the biggest thing. We just had heard there was a lot something going on, and then of course we heard that the Tet was going to be really cool. Everybody's going to maybe stand down because it was supposed to be a religious holiday. So that's pretty cool. So we're looking forward to that. We thought maybe we'll go to the rear and have a few days off, which uh, that didn't happen. And uh, But that was where it was at that time. It, it was just, it seemed like the more we were in, the more intense we were getting and more serious about things and not taking things for granted, you know. So uh, that's probably the best I could say. Yeah, I, I went on, first I went on R&R &R to Hawaii to visit my wife. That was kind of neat. And then I came back, and they said they needed somebody to go to this leadership class. And I go, what's that? And I said, why me? And they said, because you're the only one here, NCO. You're the only one here, so you're going. So that's a four, a four or five-day number. That was probably right around, had to be 2nd or 3rd of February, 1st or 2nd of February. And uh, that last day, I mean... Up until that, it was just bored. I, I wanted to get out of there so bad. I was trying any way I can get out of here to get back to the unit. And um, then that night, I think on the 4th or the 5th, 4th maybe, uh, we went back to our, our, our hut, if you will. And this was probably 20 men in this hut. And a lot of these, from what I understand, were people who had just came into country. So they were awaiting orders. They hadn't gotten any weapons. I guess they had been given their weapons, but no ammo or anything like that. And so I just kind of hung out there by myself because, you know, I was the only one that had any kind of, you know, been there a while, I guess. And so uh, we heard some rumbling going on. And one of, the, one of the senior sergeants came in and said, Hacker, I want to see you. So he says, uh, we got some things going on in the perimeter. We, we need to have these people put on there, but you're going to have to take them out there and just set them on the perimeter, tell them just to be quiet. Don't do anything stupid, and whatever. So he gave him a rifle and two clips of ammo, I guess it was. And I don't know what they gave. I, gave, I guess they gave him a clip. So I went on the perimeter with these guys. I just said, just stay down, stay low, don't do anything, just lay down. And uh, then uh, the next morning, I think it was, I, I'm trying to keep the, 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 the events going on, but that's when I heard that... Uh, one of them came to me and said, your unit's in, in, a, in a world of hurt. I, I was, ran into something. And I said, well, how do I get out there? And they said, well, you don't have to get I said, I want to get out there. I don't want to be around here because I'm, I'm going to get killed here. Really clever. And uh, so Van Horn was with me. I, ran, I met Van Horn at the, at the chopper pad, and we went out together. That's what it was. We went out together. And we, we started taking rounds in the marine choppers. And they said, it's a hot LZ. So, okay, hot LZ. So uh, I just prepared myself the best I could when we got off the chopper. Then it, all this confusion was going on. I mean, everything was going on. They said, we got to get out there. Uh, tour, and I guess we had just gotten out there, or it was just after when all, the, well, the shit had already hit the fan is what I'm saying now, but I can think about it. So I got out there, and... We were trying to find a place. We were trying to secure the graveyard, the cemetery, and I found Shul. Well, Shul was there, but I think he was wounded at the time. And he said, "Hacker, just take care of that over there." And I said, "Okay." And then they, then they turned around. And he was gone, and we went out to pull out some more of the uh, wounded and and dead as we found them. And then uh, I think it was the next day, either that night. I do remember that we had the dead over here, and we were trying to put ponchos on them. And it, was, I, I, it seems like to me it was at night. It had to be night because it was very eerie. And the chopper came in and blew all of the, the, the uh, ponchos away. And I just, then I, I, I see these guys. And of second platoon, I probably knew four or five pretty, I mean, talking to them, working with them sometimes. And I saw a couple of them that I knew. And I go, oh my. And then I really got scared. And I think it was Mac who said, Hacker, get these guys on the chopper. You guys get the, on the chopper. I think Alan was there too. Alan's everywhere. 
and we were putting that on on the uh, chopper, put them on the chopper, and then I think it was the next morning we went through another sweep out there to pull out, and we found a few more of our wounded that were sitting out. I mean, all night long they've been out there, and we pulled them in, and there was a few uh, enemy out there that uh, we had to shoot off, and Alan pulled off a couple of them, so did Keneva. And so we pulled all the rest of these people to the back, and then uh, that's when we found out that Captain Brennan, well, I had found out Captain Brennan had been shot. And if I remember, I'm, I'm juggling around a little bit. Well, I know when I came out there, Captain Brennan was being flown, was being lifted out. And I looked up there, and there he was. And he looked at me like, be careful. And uh, I thought, what's going on? What, what has happened here? All these people that I grew up with are gone. And uh, that next day, if I remember, it was when Wendover took over and said, we're going, we're moving out over here. I thought, where are we going? Why don't we go to the rear? Why don't we get out of here? But he kept us out there. And uh, I do remember, you know, we were trying to get things cleaned up the best we could as far as, you know, get, gathering all the uh, equipment. And all that equipment was full of blood and everything. Just put it on a chopper so we can get out of there. And then uh, uh, I think I, that might have been the first time I met Lieutenant Swank. I, I'm not sure. Because something about, uh, I think he was artillery. So Wendover, they were both second lieutenants, I believe. So Wendover was infantry. So naturally, he's in charge of the, the company now. And uh, until somebody else came out there. And, uh, but I know those, those two or three days out there was such a mess. There was, and we couldn't get enough ammunition. I, I remember, you know, there was like M14 ammo there. And I go, well, this is not an M14, these are M16s. I think they finally brought it out there. But, you know, I, me, I, I wanted to make sure I had plenty of ammo. And it just seemed like I was, we had the wrong ammo there. But we got it straightened out eventually. And then uh, we went out on this, these patrols that Wendover had for us to do. Well, it was just flat. I couldn't, I mean, flat. And blood everywhere. I mean, you know, some of these, some of these guys, or good old boys, if you will, coming from the country, they, they were used to seeing stuff like this. I wasn't. I, I'm looking at this, I'm seeing blood and stuff and trying to you know pay attention and be careful you know uh Keneva was always telling me watch out watch out and I'm looking around you know Gary Keneva was from California and uh but we were we were out there to make sure there was nothing left back there rifles and stuff like that as well as wounded which I think we had taken care of all the wounded and uh, my understanding all of them were accounted everybody was accounted for because one of the uh, sergeants I, I found was his hands were tied behind his back and they had shot him and uh, so at that time by the time this is I think our second sweep if I'm not mistaken we had pretty much gotten everybody out of there so now we were just getting the gear out of there that that was some of it we just left I didn't we didn't want to touch the stuff but we want to make sure that the rifles were collected and uh, anything like that that the enemy could possibly go back and use down the road so uh, and that was pretty much it, but it just was one mass of confusion, just running around, trying to stay low, and not even eating or anything. You just, you're just pay, trying to pay attention to staying alive and making sure everybody's safe. I uh, found a couple of dead there on the next day. We could see them or could hear them doing something out there in the night, so it looked like they and, and we would shoot out there from time to time, but you could tell they were pulling people out of there. And my understanding was that uh, there was a lot of KIAs out there that we, not our KIAs, so, well, yes, ours, but a lot of them. I mean, I don't know what the numbers were, but we were pretty, uh, had a pretty good size body count. And I think that was before the body counts got inflated. So we were, uh, I don't know exactly what it was, but it, I do know, uh, I was told it was a lot. But, uh, so we just got everybody out of there we could, and all, and all the equipment that we could get out of there. Yeah, I, I think we got a. We became a little harder 
a little tougher, if you will, um, and not not mean or anything like that. We just it wasn't you know we weren't the same. We weren't the same. Um, we tried to keep things in perspective, I guess. Um, but you all in the back of your mind, you know, you're thinking these guys aren't here, and we're, we're talking about second platoon in particular because the stories were going. You know, we had all kinds of stories going out there. The whole platoon was gone. We didn't know. I mean, I, I, I kept saying, "How could that happen?" The whole platoon. You know, that's 30, 40 men. How could that happen? And part of the third platoon, and and we're looking at ourselves and going, we didn't get hurt, and we weren't glad about that at all. We were, I think we were angry. I, I think I felt angry about it at first that uh, these guys sucked us in there and, and hurt us, and we're not going to let that happen again. And I, I think there was a lot of incidents that's out there afterwards that you know uh, we're not going to think about it. We're going to. It's, if there's an enemy there, we're going to take them out. We kept running into the small deaths of them, you know. Uh, not, not. I think we learned that we were never going to be caught in that position again. I don't think we ever, after Lo Shang, I, I could be wrong. I don't think we ever crossed a patty straight across. If we if we had to go from point A to B, we'd go to point A, C, and B to get there. We were not going to go straight across. And I think our leadership knew that too because we knew well, what we could face out there and it wasn't the smartest thing to do. I think um, I think the gunfighters, we learned how to fight. We learned how to uh, uh, not not to challenge leadership because you didn't do it that time in, in those days. It wasn't that, that it wasn't there yet. But I think our leadership knew too that okay, we got to go this way if we want to make this happen and come out successful with the least amount of wounds. Uh, I think our next biggest battle might have been. Uh, I think it was three fifty two with Mac. Uh, that was probably our next biggest fight, if I remember. There was a couple of small skir skirmishes that. We were involved in that. That uh, we took out enemy soldiers, but it wasn't anything large. I think uh, my squad ran into a, uh, a a couple of them. We just you know we, we took them out, but it wasn't nothing big. There was other fights, but nothing major. But I think the biggest one was we had incidents like with uh, with Gary Gary Stadium getting killed. That was just a heartbreaker because you know everybody liked Gary. He was just a uh, he was. He was a war protester, you know, and but a fighter, and uh, but he always had a smile on his face, and uh, challenged everything. He would always say, "Why are we doing that?" You know, and we go, well, "I don't know," and uh, and then when he was killed, it was like that. I think that's probably where death sunk into me the most because you would never think gas Gary Allen Stay would ever get killed. It just wasn't. In the in the in the books, and he and I were sitting up on a hill beforehand before we went down to where we he was killed, and he had a great artist. He was a, he was an artist. He he had drew, uh, drawn Disneyland on the side of his helmet. I thought that was really cool, and I was going to ask him to do that for me too. And then, you know, the shit hit the fan you know, some hours later, and uh, I think it was Gary and. Alan and, and another soldier, another guy was on, on that, and then just all of a sudden things blew up. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a bullet or a mine or a booby trap, and the whole thing came at stadium and killed him. I mean, I think they tried to revive him, and the medics were up there, and Alan, I don't, I, he had blood all over him. Again, I have no doubt if he was wounded or just because he was there. Alan was everywhere, and uh, they took him on the chopper, and uh, he died, I think, on the way, if I'm not mistaken. But and that that really that really hit a lot of people. It hit me really hard because I thought this is way over my head. I just was maybe it was shock or stress, but I just really got very nervous now that all this stuff was happening. And here we are. I still had four months left, I guess. I think that was May, April, May, and uh, June, July, August. Yeah, I had three or four months left. Four months left. 
uh, am I going to get through this? I just, you know, trying to keep a cool head was very difficult sometimes, especially with these, these, these pillars that were being hurt. And then Mac was like the next month, I believe. Yeah, in fact, we were watching, I, says, I look back and I say, we were watching the war. Because you saw these, uh, I was told it was airborne, but I don't know. They were trying to take that hill. And we're on our LZ and we're looking at it. And one of the guys had those big binoculars. And they said, hey, Hack, look at this. And we're looking at it, we were watching the war. And they got on there and then, oh, they took the hill. And all of a sudden, they started running back off the hill. So it was like, they took the hill, the enemy went away. The enemy came back, they went away. And then um, I think it was that night or afternoon, evening, that Mac told me that we were going to go and take that, we were going to go out that hill. And uh, I think at that time I was probably the squad leader temporarily. And uh, I said, how would we do that? I mean, wasn't that Marines or somebody who tried to take them? And now they we're going after them? He said, just, just shut up and do the job. Okay. So we went out the next morning, I think it was. We left early. And again, we were, you know, we were a little concerned because we felt like we were a little shy on ammo. You know, I mean, uh, Stud and Dud said we need more machine gun ammo. We're trying to get that. And we had scrounge that up. We got it. But it was, you know, I'm thinking, wow, we're not, are we ready? So we went down there early and, and we got down to the base of the hill, and the only funny story I can come out of this thing was I had a chaplain come in, and a jeep, or whatever it was. And he says, I'm here to do general absolution. You guys want to, and I'm a Catholic. I said, okay, sure. And I said, now, what is a general absolution? <laughs> you, know, you know, I was so much like a, I don't know, Vietnam grew me up. I don't know what it is. That's sad to say. But uh, he, they said to me, general absolution. I said, what does that mean? Well, if you get killed, you know, your sins are forgiven. I didn't hear that part. So went to the, went, then we go up the hill. Now, if I remember, we went up like three lines, which was made sense because, you know, we knew we didn't want to go online. And I do remember those other guys that got around the hill did go online. They weren't straight lines like we were, if I remember. So we go up there, and I think Alan... The group was over here. Mac was with someone over here, and we were like in the middle thing, if you will. So we go up there, and we start receiving fire, and uh, they call in mortars and stuff like that. And then they called off the mortars because we were getting closer. And then all of a sudden, the intensity of the fire came so fast, so hard, that it knocked us down to the ground. And we were trying to get fire going up there. And I just couldn't seem to get it up there. We couldn't quite get the firepower going. And, I, and that was a time where I thought, this is it. I think this is going to be it. I just was trying, I, you know, I'd fire off a couple of rounds, but it was just, you know, it wasn't very accurate or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, this boot was right by my face, and it was Mac. And, then, you know, he was just a few feet from me, so let's go. And we just instantly got up. I mean, no thinking about it. I, I think back on this, I, I get very nervous about it, because seconds ago, I, I, if I would have done it, I would have been killed. But it just happened. And then Mac goes over this way, and he starts firing up there, and all of a sudden, they, they, it looked like they turned their attention towards him. That, that key few seconds that gave us the opportunity to return fire, and we really shot it, we really threw a lot of ammo at him. And way over here, I see this guy going on the hill, and it's Alan Allen. Where does he come from? And he just came up the side, and here's Mac. And so we focused on Mac, and we start, you know, and he goes from one hole to the next, and we're, we're trying to keep fire ahead of him. And by the time we got to the top, he had knocked off, like, I think, three fire, three uh, machine guns, if I believe it right. And then we just cleaned up the rest, and they all left. And then the one thing we did do that the other guys didn't do, we called an artillery beyond. And I think that's what saved us from them trying to regroup. Of course, I, I think between Mac and Allen, they, they probably knocked off half of them. Uh, which they didn't weren't able to do before, and I go over there. His Mac laying down on the ground. He's been shot up, blown up. I don't know. I don't know how he lived. And barking orders out. Just stay 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 solid. He looked at me. and says, "Give me a report 
what do you mean give you a report? And they all say, take him, you know, and Alan's over here and then he's gone. And so here comes the captain and he says, uh, what, how's it going? What's going on? Something like that. Give me a report. And I said, well, we're cleaning this up now. If it looks like they're gone. The artillery's hit good. And he said, good. As he was walking away, I said, you know, are, are we going to get a medal for uh, Mac? And he said something like, oh, yeah, we're going to put a silver star in it for him. And I said, I don't think that's good enough. I said, I, I think you should get the Medal of Honor. And he stopped a moment and looked at me, and he says, oh, why do you say that? And I said, well, number one, he saved my life. I would have been dead. Number two, he saved our squad's life. We would have been dead. And number three, I think the company would have been wiped out if these guys hadn't taken action. And he said, okay, we'll see what we can do. So that's about the last I heard of that. By that time, uh, I'm not sure where Alan was. That was one time I lost all where Alan was. But uh, a few days later came down, they wanted information about the fight with, with, for Mac, what had happened. About, and they were talking about possibly a Medal of Honor. So uh, it, was, uh, it could have been the first sergeant who came up to me and said, okay, I want you to write all this stuff down. And I said, okay, what, what, can I come back to the rear to do this? He says, no, you do it out here. I said, what do you mean I can do it out here? I mean, what am I, he says, here's a, here's a piece of paper and a pencil. Now, remember in those days, we didn't have, you know, computers. So I, I just wrote the stuff down the best I could. And he said, make sure you get everybody's name that you've got in, the, in, the, in there too. So I wrote everybody's name in there. And I guess what they did, they took it back to the rear, and I guess everybody put it all together and, uh, compiled all this information. I never heard anything more uh, at that time, not until about a year after I got out of the service. And uh, Mac, for some miraculous reason, was able to get back into action pretty quick. And I couldn't believe that he was back, you know, and just taking over. Uh, some of these guys were Superman. I mean, they really were. And, uh, and then I met the chaplain about about three or four days later, you know, we were back, back down at the base camp, and, uh, or maybe we were at LZ, and uh, he said, uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you made it. He looked at me and says, hey, I'm glad you made it. I said, yeah, thanks for all that, that uh, uh, the general absolution, because now all, of, all, my sins are saved, all my sins are gone. He said, he looked at me, he goes, that's not the way it works, Hack. I said, what do you mean? He says, you had to die. I said, what do you mean you had to die? He says, yeah, if you general absolution, if you've died. All sins are forgiven. So I, I said, you mean all my sins are not forgiven? <laughs> so that, that was one of the highlights of the war, I guess. I just realized that, okay, it's a good thing I didn't die because, I mean, you know, whatever. I thought I was going to get saved, but I didn't at that moment. Well, we saw him going up there, right? And so, you know, I thought, okay, we got to follow him up there or do something. And he got up there and, and he started firing these guys and he just said, come on, let's go. And, I mean, that was it. I mean, we were getting up when he was going up there, but when he got up and he said, go, we started running up there then. I mean, everybody, I mean, they were passing me up. Everybody was running up there. So he really got everybody going. And I mean, and I'm looking over here at these guys over this. Now, my understanding on the far end, they had, some guys had run into some troops or NVA over there and got shot. But then you had Allen's group that just came up too. So everybody was converging on this thing quickly. And I mean, it was... It was Mac who really got everybody motivated. It's just one of those things. You know, here's a guy. You, you would follow. Well, we did. You follow him into the fire. If he said, if he says jump in that hole, you're going to jump in that hole because you know it's the right thing to do. He told me one time. He says, you know, Hank, I have a better chance of getting killed than you do. Oh, that's nice. What, what does that mean? He said, well, you're a young guy. You learned. We taught you how to do things, and you're doing it without thinking. Me, I'm at an age where I think too much, and that's going to get me in trouble. Don't think. Wow, that's from Mac. So when he says don't think, you don't think. He had to be had to be in his probably his mid forties, I would think, because he, uh, I think he went in the army like during Korea, and he had been popped out a few times. You know, he was he really drowned, put that, that that liquor down when he wanted it. And uh, but he was when he went when we were in when we were in the fight, I, I, ne I he was never drunk in the fight never, but when we were back, watch out he can put him down with the best of them, 
but uh, he was just the kind of guy, uh, you know, he came from a small town in Texas, I believe it was. And he mentioned sometime, he mentioned to somebody afterwards that uh, at one of the places where he said, you know, I come from a small town, I'm just a small guy, but this Medal of Honor makes me a hero. And I remember telling one guy, he says, you know, he's not the hero, he saved my life. He is a hero. And yes, I'm glad he got the Medal of Honor. Because if he hadn't got the Medal of Honor, I would have been dead. Many of us would have been dead. But uh, just a humble guy. But very, very uh, savvy to, uh, to the fight. You, you, we were so fortunate to be with him. You know, that guy shot everything. I mean, he shot squirrels. You know, he had a, he skinned a squirrel, put a squirrel tail on his helmet. You know, he, uh, what do you say about that guy? You loved him. Uh, you respected him. That's the best way I can describe Alan Allen. Uh, what really got us all really stirred up was when he got shot. I think the third time, my gosh, I, don't, he, what, I think he had three, three, okay. The third time he got shot, it really cut him up pretty bad. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it was a machine gun or whatever, but it really, it, it just uh, hurt him for life, if you will. And there again, and that was, I think, just, it was after stating. So in this period of time, in this period of time, we had Stadium get, got, had gotten killed. We had this big battle with Mac being shot up and others. And then we had Alan Allen. And I think, uh, from my point of view, when he got hit too, I mean, now I'm really getting... I, I wasn't nervous or scared. Or anything. I was just hard. I was hard by that time. Because I thought, anybody who sh kills Alan Allen or hurts him, it's got to pay. You've got to pay. And I mean, I was on I was on a vengeance after that. When he got hurt, I thought, you know, I want to. If I find another enemy soldier, I'm going to shoot the crap out of him because I, I want vengeance. So uh, when he was, I think he was on point the time when he got shot up uh, on this hill. He was. It was just a weird situation. I don't know if we were stopping or whatever, but he he might have been on point. But that's where he got hit. And, uh, but when he was on point, everything was peaceful. It was like one of those things, okay, if Alan's on point, we're good. We're safe. That's the best way I could describe him. But that guy was, I mean, it was everything. And he ate everything. I mean, he and I would sit down. We sat down a couple of times to break bread. And he'd have food all over the place. Me, I'm, I'm begging for food, you know. And uh, he had cans of food. I don't know where he, I don't know where he stored it. He was, you know, he was thin as a rail. Probably weighed eighty pounds, wet. But uh, lots of a lot of good common sense about him. Just good old Kentucky windage about just how to do how he had a feeling about things. I don't know what it was, but I felt comfortable when I was around him because I knew that uh, if something was wrong, he'd first he'd find out. He'd know about it first. A wonderful man. Yeah, we, we, were, we were close. I mean, we were close within our squads, our teams, if you will, you know, and we would reach out to other members of the, of the company, but we were, we were pretty tight closely, you know. But the gunfighters were, we, we felt pretty special being a gunfighter. That was just something that I felt was uh, a badge of honor. Uh, it's helped me through some of the things I've gone through in civilian life. Um, and when I told people I was a gunfighter, they go, what does that mean? And I said, we're just great soldiers. We were the, we were the best of the best. You know, all of us were good people over there. I don't care who you were. When you're, the, when you're in the field, Marine, Airborne, whatever you are, Navy, I don't care who you are, you're the best of the best uh, in service. But I think we felt we were pretty special. And we got hard in the way of looking after one another. Uh, when something happened, we looked around to make sure 
but we were good. Nothing was badly happening. Uh, so uh, I think it, it carried on in a civilian life because you, you felt pretty proud. You know, the Marines are always proud of themselves. Uh, I don't say the Army sometimes isn't always proud of themselves because what are they? So not that they weren't proud of serving. It's just, you know, as a gunfighter, you were pretty special. You're pretty special people. Uh, we did a lot of things. We saw a lot of things. Um, we tried to keep our perspective about us and, and not get weird. And we knew our limits. I think we all knew our limits. We all knew our jobs. I think that was the thing. We all knew our jobs, and everybody uh, took care of one another. I think that's the biggest thing I learned from, uh, I took away from being a gunfighter. I'm so proud of it. Strong man, uh, very experienced. You know, this was his second tour. Um, kind of guy you could, as I, as I got more experienced in, in my position, and as we moved forward four, five, six months into the, to the tour, uh, I think he looked at me as somebody that okay, you're you're, you're part of us now. You're one of us. He only, he never thought I wasn't or any of us. He just he could see just like with Alan Allen or. Uh, some of the other guys, Gary Kinnem and what have you, uh, we were closer. He, he pulled us in a little closer, you know, because we were the original people who came over. I don't think he played us as favorites, but I think he liked the idea that we were still good. I, I remember one, one story. I get a, I, a runner comes up and says, Captain Ben wants to see you. And everybody looks at me, what did you do wrong? I said, I don't know. So I go up to the CP, and there's the first sergeant there. Now, the first sergeant and the captain together really means trouble. And Captain Brennan says, how you doing, Hacker? I said, fine, so, Captain. How you, you know. He says, um, how's your mother? I said, I beg your pardon? He says, how's your mother? I said, I, I think she's okay. He says, have you written her lately? lately? I said, uh, I, can't, I, I don't know. So he calls up this letter holds up this letter from the American Red Cross and it said that Mrs. Hacker wanted to know why we're not letting, why, uh, how to put it, why we were not letting our, the boys write home or something like that. And I said, he says, you know anything about this letter? I said, no sir, I don't. He says, well, you're going to write your mother. You're going to write, write your mother every week. And either myself or the first sergeant is going to ask you that. You better have a letter in that bag at the end of the week. And I, I mean, I got, what do you do with that? You know, I walked back, they said, well, what did the captain want? I said, he just wanted to make sure everything was okay. <laughs> what, what am I going to say? You know, but he said it with such a straight face, and then he smiled. Then he's got this thing about him. He will absolutely come at you, and then he gets that smile. And you, and you know, it's okay. <laughs> Just, I mean, you, you just had to admire the guy. The most, the, the thing that, I remember the best was when I was waiting to rotate out. You know, we were down the base cap, and we were just kind of hanging out a little bit. And we had changed over from gunfighters to Cheyenne, which everybody thought, what's that all about? And uh, I was waiting for the chopper and to take me out. And uh, I get this call. He says, uh, uh, "Gunfighter one three is gunfighter six. And I thought, "What's that? That's not that's not right." So I said, uh, "Cheyenne six. This is Cheyenne one three. And I, and I mean, I get this. This is gunfighter gunfighter one three. This is gunfighter six. So I knew it was Captain Brennan. I said, uh, well, "Gunfighter one three. You know? He says, uh, "You all set?" I said, "Yes, yes, I am." He says, "Okay, well, you know." He's, and he said something to me. He says, you know, I wish I had more 1-3s. I'd never had anybody make me feel that proud. I wrote him a letter, too, before he died. I didn't realize he had died. Well, this would be, I didn't know, realize he was sick. But I wrote him a letter. I just thanked him for everything. It was about a year before he passed, and I just said, you know, I just want to let you know that I feel I'm 
happy that uh, I've served with you and you influenced my 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 life. And uh, thank you very much. I didn't hear anything back, but and then when I found out he, he passed, I made sure that you know I sent my sentiments to him. But uh, just a great man, just a great man. Wendover, Wendy Wendover. <laughs> that was the perfect second lieutenant. Lieutenant, captain, whatever. He was, he could have gone on to have a great uh, career in the service if he wanted it because he was very, he was educated. He was, had good common sense about him. He knew when to be strong. Uh, he was, he had a lot of things that Captain Brennan had. I think he would have been another Captain Brennan down the road. He just was, he was a good leader. And one of those people that you, again, you know, we had great leaders. We had, Mac and we had Captain Brennan, we had Lieutenant Wendover. These were guys, again, I said earlier that you would go into the fire with them because they just had a feeling about them. And even though Wendover wasn't ex as experienced as, as uh, Brennan or Van Horn, of course, but he had good common sense about him. And uh, you didn't challenge him. You didn't. You know, you, you and nobody ever talked about by behind his back. I mean, other other lieutenants go, oh man, like that. But Wendover was always well respected and uh, uh, a, a very fine gentleman, but a a, a a very good warrior, very good warrior. Oh, Van Horn, what a what guy, tough as nails, and. He didn't let anything go. I mean, he didn't let anything get by him. And if you weren't doing your job, boy, he slapped you into Thursday. And I remember one guy who got all, you know, choked up and cried and was leaving and just, you know, a, a mental breakdown, if you will, God love him. But Van, Van, you know, Van Horn just absolutely went after. You know, I thought this guy was a man's man. I didn't know he was a man. I mean, you got to be a man. I mean, he was... Uh, and his training was very tough. He was very tough on us. And uh, at the end of the day, you were glad he went away because you could relax a little bit. But uh, again, he uh, he was probably, he had two tours, I guess, he had in Vietnam. And I think he had a, a vendetta or something against him because he went after people and went after the enemy like it was. And that's why he got shot up at uh, Lo Jang. Uh, he just went charging out there, you know, instead of, Taking a moment to see what's you know what's going on, he just went out there, and uh, he got shot that day. And uh, I think somebody even shot him by mistake, you know, because he came in. And I heard somebody say somebody shot him. They shot him, and somebody shot him by mistake. I was like, what? What happened to that? And I don't know the story on that, but I, I didn't see Van Horn after that. But uh, the time we had about two months before we deployed until Lojane, he was our man, and. Uh, you better be right. You better be straight with what you're doing with him. He will hurt you. And <laughs> a little fear, but again, you learn well from him. Well, I'll tell you something. I, that's another one. I, I surprised I survived because I went to uh, Chulai. I think they, oh, they took us down. Was it Pleiku? Somewhere there. We flew. It may have been Chulai that we flew out and I walk in to the uh, to the NCO club you know, I got there and I just come out of the field and I just put on some new fat fatigues and I just I'm out of here I don't care they said get whatever you want I said I want I don't take nothing home I got my shaving kit and that's it and we, we had a few rides oh well, well I'll tell you that one in a minute um, but I said I don't want nothing and um, I go in there and here and I, I at that time I had a marine cover Marine cap, and a Marine had given it to me before Tet, and I liked it. I liked the style of hats I wore, and I got this gunny sergeant walk up to me, and I, you know, I had my army, so he says, uh, oh, "What do you got that cover on for?" I said, "My cover." He said, "That's a Marine cover. Your army. I want you to take that cover off." Now you got to understand, a being gunfighter did teach me something to be mean, not mean. Just don't mess with me. You know, you know where I've been? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not taking it off, Gunny. I said, uh, 
That's what Marine gave me this, and uh, I think I, I appreciated it, and, and I'm wearing it. So I went to have my drink. He says, "Oh, Marine gave it to you." I said, "Yeah, I got it. Marine gave it to me." He said, "Don't buy any drinks. I'm giving you all the drinks." And that guy got me so sloshed that when I went on the plane the next day, I had no idea. I mean, he actually helped me with all that because, uh, and he got on the plane with me. And I remember him saying something to the stewardess or whoever she was: "says Just leave him alone." And I don't really remember the flight home. But I do, you know, I, I do remember waking up in the bunk and, and, I, and I, uh, I wrote a story about this. I said uh, there, was that, there was a song, uh, uh, Honey, by um, Bobby Goldsboro that was being played. And it startled me. And I went to reach for my rifle and it wasn't there. And I panicked. And I go, where's my rifle? And then I kind of propped myself up and I looked down and I had my boxer shorts on and my, I was clean. And the first time I heard these words that we always heard before was, I'm safe. I survived the NOM. Game over. It was amazing. You know, I did not, and I, I lived in San Francisco, right? And I, Santa Cruz was the capital of, of protesting. But I never told anybody I served. I never told anybody for many years that I was... Uh, uh, in the service, or let alone served in Vietnam. And it was my father who had, had gotten out, you know, I'd been out about six months, I guess, and he said to me, he says, I, I want to I send you and Sandy, my wife, to, uh, to uh, the, uh, oh gosh, the golf course up there in San Francisco area. And he says, uh, I'll, I'll pay for everything, three days, you know, food, golf. I was just learning how to play golf. He says, but I want you to see us... Uh, a psychiatrist friend of ours, of the family. And he says, you only have to go twice. So I thought, hey, that's, that's not a bad idea, not a bad deal. I'm going to go to uh, Spyglass, play golf, you know, beautiful courses, beautiful food, beautiful rooms. And I just got to go see a doctor twice. And uh, I, went, I went out going for six months. So I think he helped me put my head on straight. Uh, but I didn't. But again, I didn't say anything to people. We, I, I, I would go to for these parties, and friends would say, "Where you been?" I said, oh, "I've traveled for a while." That's all I said. You know, my my wife would go, "Really?" You know, uh, but uh, I didn't say a whole lot to people for many years until, actually, I think it was my daughter who said, uh, "Bob said you were in the army." Yeah, yeah. What'd you do? I said I walked around a lot of in all the field, just you know stuff. Never got any details until she started putting things together and saying, oh, okay. Now she's in her mid-20s going, oh, now I know what you're doing. Now she's in her 50s, and she goes, I, that's when she says, I shake sometimes when I hear about that year. So uh, uh, adjustment was okay uh, to a certain degree. I still have, I mean, after 50 years, I finally got rated on PTSD, and... Uh, you know, so um, things have, have worked out, I guess.